What's up guys, Alexander here. Today I want to share a topic that I covered in one of the articles on my website. Right now the channel is very small, but there's a lot more people that have visited the website and I've gotten some feedback that perhaps you would like the material to be made easier to understand or less academic. It's very research oriented on the website and I was hoping on these YouTube videos that I would be able to present it in a way that's easier to understand, kind of like an informal lecture. So eventually I would like to make all of the articles on the website available in video format. I'm not just going to read the article to you, I'm not going to make it a word for word recounting because I don't think that would actually help you guys very much. I think it would be better to explain the concepts and if you want to see it in more depth then by all means go to the website, look at the research articles that are cited there, look at the graphs that I may have copied from those articles and put into the paper or the summaries of the research and uh, so on. So without further ado, this topic is going to be about the dual mate hypothesis or the dual mate theory. This is also called in long form the ovulatory shift hypothesis or the dual mate hypothesis of ovulatory shifts. There's a sort of different names for it. So however you may have heard this before, understand that it's talking about the same thing. And this may be familiar to you once I describe it because this is probably also the origin of the alpha fucks, beta bucks ideology or paradigm in the manosphere. And I think, I'm not a manosphere historian, but I think that was popularized in The Rational Male by Rollo Tomasi uh, citing this research, which would have been I think around 2012, and the height of this research was uh, around 2008 and 2010. So what we're looking at here in the dual mate hypothesis is that women essentially, this is the idea, this is a summary, a description of it, that women have a dual mating strategy when looking for mates. On the one hand, it is a long-term mating strategy. Women want mates that are long-term providers for their offspring to form long-term pair bonds with. So they're looking for behavioral traits like being a provider and so forth, of course, the beta bucks. All right. And on the other side, women want the so-called good genes, right? And the good genes are going to be physical appearance, masculine dude, big dude, giga chad face. He's aggressive. He's dominant, perhaps. Different traits associated with the supposed good genes, high testosterone. So the idea in the dual mate hypothesis of ovulatory shifts is that when women are fertile, when women are in their fertile period, they are more likely to be promiscuous. They are more likely to cheat on their long-term beta bucks. They're going to go, they're going to find the alpha fucks. They're going to have sex with him. They're going to have his baby. And that way they can get the benefits of both, right? They can get the long-term provider, but really this long-term provider is going to be secretly caring for the offspring of the good genes alpha. So this is a hypothesis, like I said, that was developed by uh, a researcher named Stephen Gangstead. I, I think the earliest research really developing this was in 2008, and we begin to see meta-analyses and, and attempts to replicate this around 2010. Now, if you've read this article already, here's a spoiler for you, and this is where we're going from this video out. The title is, the dual mate, Why the Dual Mate Hypothesis Has Failed to Replicate. Okay, so already that should tell you something about what's going on. You have probably heard of, in psychology, what is called the replication crisis. And really this is not something just in psychology, but it's something that happens uh, across the social sciences and also across STEM fields at the moment as well. For example, in medicine, uh, currently there's a replication rate of research that's about similar to psychology. Where maybe if we're lucky, half of the research findings, half of the theories and past studies are replicating. And that's what we're seeing with all of this dual mate hypothesis research is that generally most of it has failed to replicate. Okay, so the first summary, this is when we begin to see problems. It's around, I believe, 2010, 2012. And again, you can check the exact dates and read these meta-analyses if you want. We see one that looks at all of the past research. I think it was something like 60 studies. And they said, okay, Bali, no association. There's no, there's no association between this research supporting the dual-mate hypothesis. The same year, a second one says, ah, we did find one. So early on, we're seeing these two meta-analyses, and I think to date they're the only two that actually have been conducted, where one of them says, 
overall, most of the research is not supporting the dual-mate hypothesis, and the other is saying, okay, maybe it is. And these are looking at different papers with different methodology. And that's when we're going forward into more recent research, is where we really, really begin to see a problem. Starting in about 2018, 2019 onward, we see attempts to replicate past dual-mate hypothesis research. And if you guys don't understand replication in the sciences, the idea is that you take the same study, different ways to approach replication. You can take the exact same study, exact same methodology, run it again, do the results come out? Well, if there's a real effect here, and if it's a large effect or a detectable effect, so it doesn't even have to be large, it just has to be detectable, and like it was supposedly previously, you should be able to run the same research again and detect the same effect. Okay, so that's an easy replication. Where replication really has a lot of utility in the scientific method is when you look at old studies and you begin to correct the methodology. You say, okay, well, we're going to make it a little bit harder this time to get a result. We're going to do the controls better. We're going to use better methodology and see if the result still replicates. And that is largely what we fail to see in most of the research on the dual mate hypothesis, is that it is not replicating consistently. Now, just this month, the originator of the dual mate hypothesis, Stephen Gangstad, wrote with a co-author, his last name is D, and that's all I can remember at the moment, but again, see the article, read it. It is the very first link in the paper. He covers all of the research up to this point on the dual mate hypothesis, and most of that goes into detail on the replication attempts. Just so that you know that I'm not blowing smoke up your guys' ass, this is the man who originated the theory. He recently put out a paper this month basically saying the same thing. We have a lot of recent research. Doesn't look good. It is not promising. This theory, it is not replicating well. So, the reason for this, guys, is because we're looking at ovulation here, for one. We're looking at female ovulation. If you go back not that long ago, 2008, 2010, the way these studies asked to measure ovulation was essentially by asking women, can you estimate your ovulation? Can you take a diary? Tell us when you're ovulating. And then they would do different measures of attractiveness. They would create all kinds of different experimental methodology. And if I go into that, this will take way, way too long. But if you want to see all of the different methods that they measured female infidelity, that they would have measured female predisposition to select a good genes man and so on. There's so much of it, guys. Uh, let's, and, and that's consistent for old studies and new studies. That basically is the same in the replication. So that's kind of neither here nor there. But if you want to go into those details, I would suggest, again, you want to read the article. But the big change in methodo methodological replication that we're seeing here is the measure of ovulation. So we go into the future, 2018, 2019, up to this year, 2022, and we have much better methods of measuring ovulation. Okay, and we also have better methods now of measuring things like testosterone in men, and as well, constructs, behavioral constructs that supposedly should predict the good genes man. We can use salivary tests to measure luteinizing hormone that tells us exactly when a woman is ovulating, exactly when she has those hormones, inclu including within an hourly range, which is something we didn't see in 2008, 2010, when most of these old studies were being run on the dual-mate hypothesis. And as you may have guessed from the title, the better methodology, the new methodology, is producing non-significant results. They're not detecting an effect. Women don't seem to prefer men who are more alpha when they're ovulating. They don't seem to prefer good genes men when they're ovulating. One thing that has been consistent across all of this research, including the replications, is that women do prefer men who are more physically attractive. Okay, kind of intuitive if you followed my content on this channel, or if you're even the kind of person who found this content, that probably does not surprise you. Women prefer more attractive men. A second finding that has been consistent across all of this is that women's sexual desire goes up when they are ovulating. But a preference for short-term to long-term mates does not. So, if you are in a relationship with a woman, a long-term relationship, when she is ovulating, her desire for you will be higher. If there's an interaction with physical attractiveness and ovulation, her desire for you will be even higher. 
If this is a single woman, her desire for short-term relationships when she's ovulating will be higher as well. And if you look at a graph that I have in the article from a study that ran this and plotted it in a graph, you see preference for short-term and long-term mates in parallel, they go up. And interestingly, women consistently report a preference for long-term over short-term mates, which is consistent with all of the evolutionary research, all of the evolutionary psychology theories on this, because of course, getting pregnant is very costly for a woman. Women historically, in, and I say historically, but really in human evolution, human prehistory, women do not prefer to get pregnant on a man, by a man who is just going to dip and leave her to raise the baby by herself. So of course we have selected heavily for monogamous relationships, for serially monogamous relationships. Human beings don't form lifelong pair bonds, but they do form pair bonds that last long enough to raise a child with two parents, with a co-pair of human beings raising the child. And many things in human biology and evolution reflect that, such as the long gestation time, nine months, the long uh, juvenile or adolescent period of the child to be raised, as opposed to think of like a puppy or a goat, it's running around you know, within a couple of months, it's basically an adult at that point. So we see that ovulation does have an effect, a consistent effect measured across the replications. Women prefer sex more when they're ovulating, which makes intuitive sense because that is when women are most likely to get pregnant, essentially when they can get pregnant. Uh, so they're going to seek out sex during that period. That would be something that increases genetic fitness and reproduction. Perfectly clear from a biological evolutionary standpoint why that is so. But what we don't see is that women prefer the so-called good genes men. And I've been doing good genes. And let me tell you why that is. It's because the good genes hypothesis of selection is also something that has not been able to replicate well. And I don't cover that in this article, but I will in a future article. A lot of the things that we associate with good genes, uh, they're kind of mixed, as probably as to what you would think of as good genes. But they're also mixed as to what traits are good genes from an evolutionary fitness standpoint. And that means what traits are most likely to enhance the reproductive fitness or the number of viable offspring that will produce a second generation. So a short digression there. Returning again, we see that women prefer to mate when they're ovulating. They have higher sexual desire, but they don't show a preference for infidelity. They don't show a preference for short-term relationships over long-term relationships. Great. Now, I would like to look at one more element of the dual mate hypothesis. Uh, second avenue that we can look at it from that is different from the original experiments and all of the replication, which has all been around testing ovulation and a female preference for short-term or long-term or pair-bonded versus unfaithful cheating behavior. And this is extra pair parenting, or essentially how many men historically in human history have been cucked, right? How many men have there been who have been raising the child of another man? And this is something that today we actually know really, really well, both from genetic studies of human prehistory as well as from modern studies of entire populations in Europe. Because some countries, recent countries in Europe, have kept databases, genetic databases, of most of their population. So what we actually see, and you can read a literature review on the website of this as well, only about 2 to 3 percent of human beings in the last 10,000 or so years of human history have raised a child outside of the family. So how common is cucking in humans? It's not. It's, it's very, very uncommon, guys. If the dual mate hypothesis were correct, we would expect that to be a much higher number or a different way of looking at it. If it is correct, it is a very, very minority fringe strategy. Most women simply are not doing it. Most babies are not being produced that way. So, quick summary guys, I think that's it. That's a quick summary of the article, but I really like if you guys went, if you want to know more about it, if you want to look at the exact details of the studies, of what the original author and generator of the hypothesis himself has said recently as of this month, and also of the genetic studies, go to the website datepsychology.com, have a read, and I'd really like to know what you guys think about this in the comments. I'd like to hear your opinions. And especially if you have read research to the contrary. If you have seen anything that, that would make you think otherwise on this. 
Uh, a final note, I'd just like to go, I was going to sign out, but just a final, a final conclusion here. A lot of people still believe this dual mate hypothesis because this is very recent research that has been basically dethroning it, so to speak. Even in recent interviews I've seen with Jordan Peterson, for example, he references it as if it were a, an established fact. Of course, you should know from the name dual mate hypothesis. This is not considered a fact. It, it is a potential explanation. It was a very controversial one from the beginning has become more and more controversial, and now it's as controversial as it ever has been since most of the research on it has not been able to replicate very well. Anyway, guys, I'm going to sign out now, and I'm glad I got to talk to you all, and I hope to make another video and talk to you all very soon.